excited about that finally back in Ephesians? How many chapters are there? Six. Six. And we're in chapter we're in chapter five. We're really moving now. <laughs> I told y'all one time I preached in Ephesians for three years, so um, y'all should be appreciative that we're gonna cover it in about a year. That's not too bad. I'm I'm half in my time every time I go through it. Um, but we are, we're, going, we're in chapter 5 tonight, and, and remember that part of the book has to do with our reaction to the teachings for the first half of the book. So Paul is explaining who we are in Christ, something we're all familiar with as I, as I go over every week. I better silence my phone, because uh, a lot of people don't know I'm having church right now. So, let's, uh, let's jump into that. Ephesians, a deeper dive. It's been set for a little while, let's see if it's working, it is. So what we've been doing, the author is God, the Apostle Paul is the writer, the church at Ephesus is the intended audience. Ephesus was located in modern day Turkey, called Asia Minor then, it was written about 60 AD, carried by a guy named Tychicus, who was one of Paul's companions, traveled with him, we learn about him in Acts. The purpose of the book is the explanation of the basic principles of the Christian's walk in grace. And Paul teaches and emphasizes grace, and I want to emphasize that this evening, um, Ephesians tells us directly that not, you know, we're not saved by works. We are saved um, by grace through faith. And so we're told that in Ephesians chapter 2. That's going to be important this evening because we're going to run into a verse that a lot of people like to point at and say you can't be sure of your salvation. So like I said, the first three chapters are doctrine, teachings. The second three chapters are practical application of that or our duty in response to that. In chapter one, Paul. St- in chapter four, verse one, Paul started talking about the believer's walk, and he's still emphasizing the believer's walk. Um, he talks about being renewed in your mind, and and that's important for our believing walk for us to have a different understanding than we did as as we were when we were lost. And remember, Paul writes initially um, to this in this book. He writes to the Gentiles, and he explains how. Salvation came and, and he was part of the, you know, the Israelites and how all those things were to the Israelites, but now Gentiles have been included too, which a lot of the early church struggled with. And so we're talking about having a renewed mind. He says, let no corrupt talk, talk come out of your mouth, such as good for building up. So he's, he's wanting to encourage people to think different and act different because of the grace of Christ. And then chapter 4, verse 30 said, and don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed until the day of redemption. Is that word sealed important to us? You know, we think about it, and most of us know about the signet ring that a a king would wear, and when he would write a document and put a little wax on it, take that signet ring and push into that, and it was sealed, and it wasn't to be opened except for the person it was intended for. And so that's kind of the picture that Paul's talking about here, but you also get a sense of like a ball jar or a mason jar when it's sealed. It's closed, and until it's opened, it's, it's protected and taken care of. And we are sealed by God unto the day of redemption. That's important for us. Then he talks about some things to get rid of. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. So he's telling them, you know, this isn't the way Christians should conduct themselves or how they should live. And then verse 32, he says, be kind to one another, be tenderhearted, be forgiving to one another as God forgave you and I I go over those verses because as soon as you get to chapter one I mean chapter five verse one it starts with that famous bible word therefore and whenever you see a therefore you've got to study and learn what it's there for right so you're starting a brand new chapter I just love the, the the people who put the chapters and verses in because some of it makes no sense whatsoever when this was originally written there was no chapter breaks. Remember that. There were no verses. It's handy for us to look it up. When I say turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, you can flip over and find it. Otherwise, I'd have to say turn until you see a therefore. And then you'd have to hunt for that therefore in there. And I'd say, well, it's, it's about halfway down in the letter. And it would be, so it makes it easy for us. But sometimes the break is uh, not convenient because it breaks up a thought that Paul was already teaching. That's why I read those previous verses. So he's telling them, change the way you think. Renew your mind. And then what happens from a renewed mind is you get a renewed walk. You get a new way of approaching things. And so chapter 5, verse 1, he says, therefore, be imitators of God. So he just told them, 
Put away all wrath and malice and anger and slander. Put away all those things. And before that, he said, treat one another with love and with kindness and with affection and those kind of things. And then he throws in the therefore. See, the therefore is all the things he just said are ways for us to be imitators of God. He says, therefore, because of all these things, because you can put away these thoughts. You, remember, that's, that's something that the lost world, the people that don't have Christ and the Holy Spirit living in them, uh, nothing they do is equated with righteousness. You, there's nothing you can do that equates to righteousness. And even though we know people that don't know the Lord that would do good things in our mind, when it comes to salvation, they have absolutely no value. They don't change anything until you're washed in the blood of Christ and renewed and in filled with the Holy Spirit can you then begin to live outside of the sin nature that you once were captive to. Now, we also know that Christians still commit sin. Amen? Amen. Got the right crowd. Okay, good. That's, you know, it's one part of the struggles because we still have the edemic nature, that part of Adam that was handed down, but we also have a new nature that comes through Christ and that's why Paul was able to say, be imitators of God. Could you imagine without the Holy Spirit and, and God leading Paul to give the command, therefore be an imitator of God? It's completely outside of any possibility without the Holy Spirit to be an imitator of God. You may be able to fake some of these things that were listed, but the whole scope, Paul says, be an imitator of God as beloved children. We're his beloved children. We are his children through our faith in Jesus Christ. We are children of God. We've been adopted into a new family. And Romans goes into great detail about what it means to be adopted and be part of a new family. So Paul is, is quite a bold statement, don't you think, for him to say, therefore, be imitators of God. It's a command. It's something not only are you commanded to do, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, you have the ability to do. And when we get our mind right, remember he's been talking about renewing the mind, Thinking right, thinking right, and then when we begin thinking right, we begin acting right. And that's what he's saying. This is the acting right part. Because you have a renewed mind, because you have this ability, because you have the Holy Spirit, things can be and should be different in your life. He says walk in love. Remember chapter 4 started off with walk? He's still dealing with the same theme. How we live our life, how we conduct our life. Therefore, walk in love. Now that's a theme that's all over the Bible. And, and we know about, the you know, there's four different words translated love in the New Testament. But when we look at it, all we see is love. This kind of love is was what they call agape love. It was a sacrificial kind of love where you could put others first. So there's brotherly love that's mentioned in Scripture. There's eros, which is intimate love between, um, between in a couple. And then, you know, there's one more word, that, and I forget that word because it doesn't occur that often, that also is translated love. But then there's agape. And this word agape means sacrificial, putting others first. It's translated in 1 Corinthians 13 in the King James as charity. How many are familiar with the love chapter? You begin reading it and it's, you know, charity does this and charity does that in the King James. Pick up a new translation, it says love. Well, the King James translators are trying to let you know it's more than just the kind of love like I love my dog, I love my job, I love to fish, those kind of things. It's a love that puts the needs and welfare of others first. And that is a God kind of love. If you go back and look at the cross. You see God's love expressed perfectly in Christ as he came and he died for us. So he says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Can you hear that sacrificial love? Here's the fun part. Paul setting us up for later, off in this, later on in this chapter because um, we're going to hit that word submit Y'all remember that? Everybody knows Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your husband, right? But before we get to that, he talks about submission to one another as believers. He also talks about husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. Well, how much more sacrificial kind of love could you get? And, I, and I've, I've actually had people, and that's another, I'm going to let that go. I'm starting to, we're not to those verses yet. We're probably five weeks from verse 22. So anyway. <laughs> Walk in love as Christ loved you and gave himself up for us. Think about it. He emptied himself of his glory. He emptied himself and came here, was born a baby, helpless, in the arms of a mother, taken care of by an adopted father, Joseph, raised here on this earth, emptied himself. 
so that he could grow up and die in our place. He could take our punishment on himself. So what kind of love is that? Sacrificial love. It's the kind of love that you deny yourself for the better of other people. And that's what Paul's trying to teach. It's, it's not about self-love. It's not about um, loving the things of your life. It's loving other people in such a way that you're willing to be sacrificial for them and not just blood relation, but for the body of Christ. For the people, as you look around this room, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the kind of love Paul says you want to be an imitator of God. You want to, you want to walk after his commands. This is what it looks like. It's, it comes out in love. And, and he goes on and says, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So you see, our sacrifices that we offer are not lambs on an altar. They're not bullocks and those kind of things. Our sacrifice, we give the sacrifice of praise, we're told, in the New Testament, and the sacrifice of, of love, loving other people, which is fragrant to God. And it's a weird thing because you read in the Old Testament, it talks about those burnt offerings being a savory smell to God. They they, even though he didn't desire those things, we're told, and they, they can't fix anything, but people willing to be obedient to God, obey his commandments, do the things that he's given us to do, is pleasing to him. It's like a sweet savor. It's, it's something. And so Paul's saying we still have that opportunity by walking in love and imitating God, then we achieve that pleasing savor to God. And how many of us in here tonight as Christians don't, don't we want to be that? I mean, we think about, and I thought about it many times over the last couple of weeks, um, the words that Jesus said, well done, my good and faithful servant. And, and those are words that we as servants of the Most High God desire to hear. That when we pass off this plane and we enter into the place where God's presence is, how many of you want to hear that? Well done, good and faithful servant. <coughs> so how do we do that? Paul says be an imitator of God. That's a big challenge, isn't it? So let's look at what he says. Here's some don't do's, okay? But sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness must be not even named among you as proper among saints. So remember where he's at. Remember the era. Remember what was going on in Ephesus. They had um, an Amazonian cult, if you will. They had all kind of weird um, sexual-like teachings and things like that, the whole world was, at that point, surrounded by just weirdness. Remember at Corinth, one of the ancient historians said that, that at, on the Acropolis, up above Corinth, they had over a 1,000 prostitutes. A 1,000 prostitutes that were involved in what they called worship. And so you got a place where a lot of sailors come through because there's that narrow little strip, and so... You know, a lot of times the sailors would come in and, you know, when they had to leave, they'd go up on the hillside to worship because they had all these prophets. As a matter of fact, there were, there were places and still can be seen today where, where feet impressions were made that basically led their way to the brothels. And there were, they, they talked about sandals that you could follow behind somebody that would say, follow me, follow me, and they were prostitutes. And they'd go up on the hill, and up on the hill there were, there were women and there were men and there were young, young boys. There was all kind of perversion going on in this area of Asia Minor. So when Paul's teaching them sexual immorality, he's, he's hinting back to the Old Testament where God said Adam and Eve, where God said man and wife, and that's his intention. Anything outside of that, the Bible calls immorality. Anything outside of that, and it doesn't matter what culture says or what's going on when the Bible says save yourself for marriage, that's what it means. Now, that doesn't mean that God throws people away for that. That's not what he's teaching, but he says, listen, inside the church house, inside the body of Christ, these things shouldn't even be hinted at. It shouldn't be something that's even suggested. And I hate to say it, but I know of an evangelist who told me he was visiting a church, and inside that church, there was some of the awfulest perversion that was going on that he found out about while he was there preaching a revival. They're, they were wife swapping in a church. And I know you're thinking, why are we talking about this in a, in a time of fellowship, in a time of worship? Because these things go on. They actually happen. And people think they can get away with it. Just this past year, I don't know how many Southern Baptist pastors, and don't tell how many others, have been caught in some sort of impropriety that they had to confess to. It wasn't a lie made up by the devil to sink their ministry, they were actually involved. And I'm talking about big names in the Southern Baptist Convention, names that when you hear, you just get sick on the inside. 
ex-presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention. But not only that, they put out a list, and, and I can't remember how many pages the list was, of different Southern Baptist pastors in different areas who were all accused of, maybe not proven, but accused of some sort of impropriety. And you would think, well, maybe there's one or two names of, of people. But no, there were page after page after page, hundreds of pastors and youth pastors and missionaries that had been caught in some sort of impropriety, some sort of, let's call it what it is, sexual immorality. And, and you think, well, how does that happen? Well, one of, the, one of the ways that happens is people quit imitating God and they start living a life that satisfies them. They start living according to the flesh. So Paul says sexual immorality and all impurity. That, that, that goes beyond the actual act. It goes on for the kind of lifestyle, the kind of mindset, or the kind of drive that people have. And covetousness. Covetousness is easy to figure out. It's wanting anything God doesn't want for you. If you've got something in your life that you want and you desire and you can't think of anything else but God hasn't designed it for your life, it's coveting. And the Bible calls it a sin. Later on, Paul's going to say it's the same as idolatry because you've got something that you've placed in front of your desire to please God. Anything that's in front of your desire to be pleasing to God is covetousness. It's idolatry. It's something that's taken the place of God. So Paul says this shouldn't even be named among you as is proper. In other words, you, you know this. There's, this is no surprise. Is, is it a surprise to hear this? No, Paul wrote that and we read that and we're like, sure, of course. And then we hear about the pastors and we hear about all these things and we're blown away or unless we're already jaded and we're like, yep, I've known a few my, myself. I've, I've known of, um, I can remember, my dad got kind of tired of church because he got kind of tired of preachers because he happened to be around a few preachers. And my uncle was um, a supporter of churches and things like that. So my dad got to see a few things. He did some remodeling work and some church offices one time and some things that should never be found in a pastor's office fell out of the ceiling. And, you know, those kind of things just kind of jaded my dad. Now, if anything, anybody's between you and your relationship with the Lord, they're closer to the Lord than you are. Nothing somebody else does should affect your walk with the Lord. But sometimes you're just blown away. You don't expect these things to be in the place where we worship. So he names these things. In verse 4, he says, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking. Well, he's getting cut a little bit deeper now, isn't he? I've always laughed. I haven't had it happen here, so I'm, 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 I'm free to say. But I've had in my past, I've had, I've had men say, Pastor, I want to tell you something. We've got to go out on the front porch. Why? We've got to go out on the front porch. Well, we've got to get outside the church house. I'm the church house. Why should I go out on the front porch? If you're going to say it, say it in here. And, uh, of course, they, they didn't want to do that, but we'd go outside and they'd tell you some sort of crude joke and they just think it's funny. And you know what you chalk it up to? Immaturity in their Christian walk. They just simply haven't been taught or they've quit caring. They're no longer trying to imitate God. But Paul says, let there be no filthy speaking. Let there be no foolish talk, which is just um, talk, saying things that are foolishness or, or, or maybe even against the teachings of the church or just stay away from these crazy things. As he told Timothy, he says, stay away from genealogies and stay away from you know all the rules and all stay away from all that and just focus on serving the lord and then of course crude joking um he said they're, they're out of place these things are out of place I'm not going to send you to hell as a christian I'm not going to remove your salvation but they're out of place they're a sign of immaturity you ever met an immature christian you know when you do don't you just by the way they speak or the, or the things that they think are okay, or the things that they pursue in their life. Sometimes you just meet people who never grew in their faith, and blame it on whatever you want to blame it on, but some people just never grow. And Paul's saying, listen, you need to grow up. You need to be mature. This is something you expect from a 14-year-old boy, not from a mature Christian who's maybe trying to be a leader in a church. This just doesn't have place. It's just out of place. It doesn't fit. He said, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. Can you imagine if every time somebody tried to tell you an off-color joke or something, you said, bless just, I just want to thank God for all my blessings. I've always said the same thing about, you know, people, people that come to you and want to gossip. If you say, well, let's go talk to that person right now, they're usually through telling you the tale. If you say, I don't want to hear it, once we say it in front of them, they don't want to talk about it. Um, I've had people come up to me and ask me things they shouldn't ask. Uh, somebody would come down the aisle and want to pray with me on a Sunday morning, not here again. And I've had people throughout the week say, you know, I saw so-and-so walk the aisle. What did they need to talk about? 
And that's kind of hard to, you know, a lot of times they'd even guess, well, I know this is going on in their life. Is that what it was about? Well, they kind of stick in a position where if you say no, you lied, but if you say yes, then you've, you've revealed a confidence. And, and I had a lady one time, sweet as she could be, she said, you know what I tell people when, when they ask me things that are none of their business? Well, she, she would say that, but she also said, um, I won't hold it against you for asking me if you won't hold it against me for not answering. I think, well, that's pretty good. That's not a yes or a no. That's a pointing out that you're out of place. There's no place for that in church, as, as we've all probably been hurt by somebody that didn't keep a confidence for us. You know, we, we find out later that, you know, the, the, the secret that, you know, you confided in somebody or, or a prayer request, shared it with everybody. And next thing you know, it's no longer a secret. Everybody knows, but nobody's acting like they know because whoever told it to everybody said, don't say anything but. And then they tell it to their closest friend, and they say, don't tell it to anybody but. And the next thing you know, everybody knows. <coughs> he said, how should we communicate? Not in any of these ways. We should be living a life of thanksgiving. And then my final slide for tonight, so don't worry too much. Ephesians 5, 5 through 7. <laughs> he rehearses basically everything he's been saying at the beginning of this chapter. So he says, for of this you can be sure. Now listen to what he says. No immoral, no impure, no greedy person, which goes back to the three he named earlier. The immorality and the covetousness. And this, in this place they translated it greedy uh, or impurity. He said, you know, he said to stay away from immorality, stay away from impurity, and stay away from covetousness, right? Then he comes down and he says, of this you can be sure. Now, the way that translates um, kind of makes it think that he's teaching them, but the way it actually comes across is to be sure you already know this, okay? Because they're believers he's talking to. No impure, no immoral, no impure, no greedy person, such a person as is, is an idolater. I told you he's going to say that. So to be greedy, to be covetous, is to be an idolater because you've got something between you and God, and the Bible plainly calls it idolatry. None of these, these people do not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God in Christ. Now, that's a big statement, isn't it? Because how many times, if we think about it, have we known people who are born-again believers that maybe have, these, have had these issues or this struggle or this fight or they've fallen into this? And I had a friend of mine, and the same thing's kind of said in Galatians. And I had a friend of mine who... Uh, was going through some trouble with his wife at the time, and, and there was a struggle going on in his life. And there's some things in his life that didn't belong in a Christian's life. And I was trying to talk to him about that. But he had a co-worker um, who was a charismatic kind of person. And, and basically, she, she believed you could lose your salvation. She used verses like this, and she'd say, because you have this in your life, he was married, but he was dating somebody. Because of this, the Bible says, you have no inheritance with Christ. And that really confused him. It, it kind of... You know, because a lot of people struggle with that eternal security. Is that a real teaching of Scripture, or is that just something Baptists say? And so, you know, because there's a lot of people that will say, you know, the Bible says plainly that if you're doing these things, you're not going to go to heaven. And these verses right here are used by people. Um, these people, you can be sure, no immoral, no impure, no greedy person, such as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. Well, that would make you think immediately that... Well, Paul's saying it's, maybe it's by faith, um, through grace through faith, but maybe works plays a role in it. And there are a lot of people that believe that. Not only do you have to get saved, but you've got to live right. And if you don't live right, then you lose your salvation. That's not what Paul's teaching at all. That would be, just think about how double-minded Paul would have to be, because what did he say in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14? He said, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal and the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So what does Paul say earlier in this book in chapter 1? If you're born again, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and it's a guarantee of your inheritance. So God has made a guarantee that if you're a born-again believer, the inheritance in heaven is yours. So what's Paul teaching here? Paul's teaching, how many of you have heard the story, the difference between a lamb and a pig? A, a lamb may fall down in a mud puddle, may get completely mud, muddy. That may be part of their life, but that's not where they live. A hog, on the other hand, 
loves a water. L- loves, the, loves the fact that they get. So there's a difference between a lamb and a pig. There's also a difference between a born again child of God and a lost person. And that's what Paul's teaching here. These people, this is their lifestyle. These are the people that this, this is their drive. They're immoral and they don't see anything wrong with what they're doing. They don't have any conviction whatsoever about that because everybody's doing it. And it's how I feel. This is the way God made me. Everybody say that. This is how God made me. And so they have a lifestyle of immoral. They're not just having, having accidents or making, committing sin. They're not just falling into the old trappings of their old life, which Paul is telling them to let go of and, and be imitators of God, which means there's a choice there, right? If he's telling you to do that, it's something that you can actually participate in, which means we have to make decisions along that line. How many of you have come to find out that the Christian walk is not an easy walk? Man, is it not an easy walk. If you got saved and they said, sit down now, it's, 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 it's a cakewalk from here on out, they lied to you. Because the old Adamic nature never goes away. And you know what it always wants? Its way. It wants its way. And all you got to do is have a time of weakness or a time of struggle or a time when you're not where you need to be in devotion life and in devotion to God. Other things have prep in. Maybe you're upset. Maybe you're hurt. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're sick. And, and, and we may say and do things that we wouldn't normally do. And most of us have had to go back and apologize to somebody for something that we did that was wrong. It was sin in our life. And we've had to say, you know, I was wrong for doing that. I, you know, I talked about you behind your back or something maybe not that drastic, but I, I didn't do what I knew I should do or I did something I knew I shouldn't do. James even says that, you know, there are sins of omission and sins of commission that we as Christians can commit. But the good thing about our sins is they're placed at the cross. They were already forgiven before we ever committed. You know, he died 2,000 years ago. You hadn't committed any sins yet, right? And he died and he covered those sins for all those that receive him as Savior. So what Paul's saying here is these people, these people, this is who they are. They're not falling. They're not sinning by outside of their nature. This is their nature. You, as a born-again child of God, have an inheritance that's guaranteed because God sealed you, like the mason jar, with his Holy Spirit. He has you, and your inheritance is guaranteed. You know what Peter said about your inheritance? It's uncorruptible and undefiled. Your inheritance cannot be taken away. Your inheritance cannot be defiled. Your inheritance cannot fall apart. Jesus said, lay up treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupts. And see, that's what they would do. They would bury, they had those coins, a lot of them were copper and different metals, and they would bury them to hide them, and then the ground moisture would corrode them, and then you'd go to get them back later, and they were just a lump of metal. No longer any value at all because you hid them in the earth, and that happened a lot then. He said, lay up treasure in heaven, not here on earth. As his children, we lay up treasure in heaven, and, and our reward our, our guarantee, it's guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. And I think that's important because a lot of people like to use these verses. He said, don't let anybody de- deceive you with empty words. Because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Who are the disobedient? Another way this is translated is children of disobedience. So God's wrath is coming upon those who are children of the devil, he called the Pharisees. You are of your father, the devil. But if we're of God, even when we're not living like we should, we're still children of God. And what does God do to his children not living like they should? He disciplines. And the Bible says, if God doesn't chastise you, you're not his child. That's what was verse put down in essence. You mess up, but you can lose salvation because you can't lose something you never had. That's right. That's exactly right. These people aren't losing their salvation. They never had it. They're they're living according to their nature. Paul's already said we have a new nature. We have a renewed mind. And we have the ability to follow the teachings of God. To imitate God. These folks cannot because they're living according to their nature. The hog versus the lamb. So he says um, because of these things the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. Therefore do not be partners with them. He's drawn another distinction. You're not them. This is how they live. 
You don't need to be partners with them. And what did Paul say in Corinthians? What, what, what concord or what agreement has light with darkness, with a Christ with Belial? He says, don't be unequally yoked. How many are familiar with those verses? And they got used for years and years and years about marriage. Don't be unequally yoked. But that means in business. That means in anything, if you couple yourself with somebody who's not led by the Holy Spirit, their goals and their driving force is different from yours. And it's going to be, a, it's going to be an interesting relationship. Not to say that doesn't work out sometimes, but it's always dangerous. Especially inside marriage. When, um, how often do you see that when a, when, a, when a saved young lady or a saved young man marries a lost person, um, it's, it's usually, usually, oh, every once in a while, but usually not the saved person who brings the lost people to Christ. It's usually the lost people that lead the saved people out of fellowship. It's just easier rather than having a fight. You know, you get up and try to go to church, and he says or sees, I don't know why you bother with those church people. They didn't even call you when you're sick. Has anybody ever heard that? I've had people tell me that. But they quit going to church because their husband, every time they'd get sick, nobody would call them from the church. They don't care about you. I don't know why you bother going. And so what's it do? It begins to sour that Christian because they have this unequally yoked life. And it just gets too difficult sometimes to lead that life. He says, therefore, don't be partners with them. A child of the word, world rather than a child of God. And that's what he said earlier. Be imitators of God as his dear children. And then at the close of this, he's showing you what Satan, children, look like and act like. How can they be any different? They're lost. They don't have the Holy Spirit. That's why evangelism is important, isn't it? Leading people to Christ, that's how we get renewed. That's how we get a new mind. That's how we get a new life. That's how we get a new ability to even be an imitator of God. So he's saying, he's contrasting the two lives. Be an imitator of God or be an imitator of the world. And the world... It's covetousness. The world is immorality. The, the world is impurity. The world is, is this coarse language and this way of, of handling things. And Paul draws a distinction that those that are filled with the Spirit can and should be different from those in the world. And how many of us would agree with that? That's a, tr that's a true statement. What Paul draws out here, we've seen duplicated in our life. We've been around those people that don't know the Lord. And we've been around those people that do know the Lord. Sometimes the people that do know the Lord aren't where they need to be. But if they're his children, he will chastise them. He whips his children. Why? Because he loves us too much to leave us out in the world away from his blessings. So that's my teaching for this evening. Um, let me have a word of prayer and then we'll have a discussion if you got any, okay? Father, I do want to thank you for Paul and his teaching. Thank you for allowing us to, to look at this as old as it is and as long as it's been around. Father, I pray that you would raise us up in our heart, that we would understand that being an imitator of God is something that we're called to do and it's something that we're empowered to do. And the different things that we've learned so far in Ephesians are all within our grasp as your children. Father, I pray that you would show us the path and help us to walk it. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Any thoughts on the teaching?